a brief recap of what we were working with last Sunday. What What is our topic of discussion? Sound theology. Sound theology. We'll write that one down. We're going to be on that one for a few weeks. Uh, last week, our subject was our sub-bullet, if you will. Who's God? Who's man? Who's God? Who's man? So the first week, we discussed who God is. and We discussed who man is last week. And the reason we're doing that is because your theology is going to be based on these two things. If you know who God is and you know who man is, truly, by the word of God, then your theology is sound. There are many people that have many different theologies. Uh, it's become a very broad subject. And the, the popular idea of today is you can believe whatever you want. We certainly have freedom in this country to believe and worship whatever religion we so choose. But once we start studying religion, we begin to realize that, well, they conflict a little bit, don't they? Can you think of a couple religions that probably conflict in their ideology? Islam and Christianity. Islam and Christianity butt heads a little bit. Catholicism and Protestant beliefs butt heads a little bit. You, you start to dig a little bit, even even within even within religions, denominations. Mormonism. There's a joke that I've heard, and I don't remember the joke um, well enough to. It's too long to to say, but it's a guy comes up to another guy, he's on a bridge, he's going to jump, and he says, hey, where are you from? He goes, oh, I'm from this area. Oh, I'm from that area. Hey, what church do you go to? Hey, hey, I, I go down this road, what denomination? Or, hey, I'm the same. And they go to all the way down, and they're like from the same small town, they go to the same denomination church, like, and realize that he is like one, and he's like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm Eastern Presbyterian. Oh, well, I go to West Presbyterian. Heretic, die, heretic, and throws him off the bridge, right? And so <laughs> the, the joke goes that, that um, even just a little bit of difference was enough to make him hate the guy that he was basically the same person. Uh, and so we find that there's so much nuance to what people believe <clears throat> that you cannot trust what people say to know what is right. You can't say, well, if you can believe whatever you want to believe, it's all right. Well, no, they someone has to be wrong. They conflict. They're, they're in their, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Their uh, truth is relative. Subjective. Subjective. Okay. But it's not. And then you have it's not it is not subjective. People will tell you that it's subjective, but it's not. There's such things as absolute truth. Now, one of the one of the ways of thinking that we all encounter as we go about this world is, is atheism. There are people that believe there is no God. If you've ever had a conversation with an atheist, it is an interesting conversation. I've never had a boring conversation with an atheist. Now, what is atheism as we understand it? Um, so not to misquote them, I went to atheism.org and I copied and pasted their statement. I'll read it to you. Atheism is not an affirmative belief that there is no God, nor does it answer to any other question about what a person believes. It is simply a rejection of the assertion that there are gods. Atheism is too often defined incorrectly as a belief system. To be clear, atheism is not a disbelief in gods or a denial of gods. It is a lack of belief in gods. I will paraphrase. We refuse to participate in this religion thing that you're talking about. We refuse to participate in believing. End quote. I've never heard a more childish or petulant argument against something. I don't agree with you, so I'm going to go play over here. Now, this morning, I'm not hating on atheists. I'm going to promote the truth. Lots of people, including atheists, will get bulldozed in that process. Folks, you can believe that there is no God. You can believe whatever you want to believe. It does not change what is. Reality. People want to pretend that God doesn't exist, or they want to pretend that whatever it is they believe is the one true thing. They want to believe that whatever they've got is what they need. See, most people, if you talk to them, they don't want to learn anything new. They don't want to change what they believe. 
They don't want to uh, get new information. They want to convince you or they want confirmation that what they believe is correct. In Proverbs 21, verse 2, it says, Every way of man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord pondereth the hearts. Turn to Romans chapter 1 this morning. We looked at this before. We'll look at it again. Romans chapter 1. So what, what makes mankind so wishy-washy when it comes to God, for lack of a better term? What makes us, as a race, so indifferent or adverse adverse to believing in God or believing God's word. In Romans chapter 1, verse 21. Because of that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. When people are confronted with facing the truth of their human condition, they will almost literally turn their head from it. They'll stick their head in the sand and they'll say, I don't believe that. I'm not dealing with it. I'm fine. I don't need God. You say, well, that's your opinion, Josh. It is my opinion, but I'm not trying to give you my opinion. I'm trying to show you in the scriptures what God says about people. People reject God. It's our natural state. People want to say that this, this is just a book. It's just letters and ink on, on paper. I don't have to listen to the scriptures or, or believe them. There's, there's nothing in here that proves anything. It's just, just a work of fiction. Well, growing up, I was taught that this is the word of God. But as an adult, I had to decide for myself. When you reach a certain point, you have to decide whether what I was taught was worth anything or whether or not it's really true. That's, that's part of being an adult is to determine whether or not people lie to you. When you're a little kid, that's not so much your prerogative. If dad says it is the way it is, that's the way it is. If mommy says, you know, bedtime's at six, bedtime's at six. Of course, you can argue with that, but... We have to determine whether or not this word is true. But if this Bible, if this is just a book, some fairy tale written many, many years ago, why is it so accurate on all the other things that we claim to know? It's written by 44 different authors over the span of thousands of years. However, it aligns perfectly with modern history books. It accurately predicts the fall of the Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, and the Roman Empire. There are 25,000 support, surviving supporting documents that these were historical texts, more than any religious text in existence. There's no proof. There's more proof of this than anything else you'll find. And people ignore that. It's still the most widely printed and reproduced book in history. More Bibles have been printed than anything else ever. But it's just a book. It's just a fairy. It holds scientific and logical principles that if you want to put in practice, you can test out and see if the Bible's right. If you take the dimensions for Noah's Ark and you build it, it'll float. Someone just made this up, right? You ever read a book? I'm terrible at this. I'm, I'm the worst person to watch a movie with. Like, it drives my wife insane. We, we cannot watch TV together. We'll watch some action movie, and her dad, my father-in-law, loves, like, Fast and Furious movies, Mad Max, loves to watch cars go fast and jump and all that. And my rude person sits there, 
and goes, a suspension on that car will be completely shot. There's no way it makes that jump. Laws of physics are just being ignored right here. There's no way. You don't get up after that. I just sit there and I'll pick apart everything wrong with the movie. And everybody I watch the movie with is just like, shut up, shut up, shut up. I want to enjoy the movie. That's how people are about, uh, it's, it's called suspension of disbelief. But folks, God does not ask you to suspend your disbelief when reading the Bible. He says, try it out and see if I'm right. So some scientists at the University of uh, Leicester uh, decided that they would, would try out building a, a Noah's Ark. And to their shock, they calculated it would have carried 70,000 animals without sinking if built to specifications. Interesting. Just, just, a, just a fairy tale. Just, just some... Just a random book written, right? Turn to Psalms chapter 8. Psalms chapter 8. What do men believe? What does mankind believe? What do we naturally want to believe? Anything but the truth. Psalms chapter 8, verse 1. To the chief musician upon get it. Psalms eight. What? Psalms eight. Psalms eight one? That's not it. Uh uh. That is mine. To the chief musician upon get it, the Psalm of David. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm skipping that part. It is it's just a verse. It's the title. It's the title. Sorry. That's all right. That's all right. I'll I'll read from the exact text. I'm looking down at the get rid of the verse on it. It's important. It's in there for a reason. All right. To the chief musician, one get it, the Psalm of David. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man, that thou visitest him. For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. God cannot be ignored if you're paying attention. The other side of atheism, the other side of that coin, is agnosticism. Well, okay. I cannot logically agree that there's not a God. Somebody had to make all this. And I've, I've made a couple of arguments against evolution. I think they're pretty good arguments if someone wants to argue a better argument for evolution, I'm willing to hear it, but... Uh, it's just, it's not possible. The, the, the mathematical odds of evolution happening would be considered impossible. If, and I don't, I don't particularly care for gambling, but if we, if we went to Vegas, Brother Mark, we sat down at the table, and we played cards, and I told you that there was a 99.9999% chance that I was about to win, and you were about to lose, and the chance of you losing, the chance of you winning right now, are point zero to about 22 zeros, one percent. That's the chance of you winning. Are you going to bet more money? Absolutely not. Absolutely not, why? <laughs> because we know that's not gonna happen. We just know that's not gonna happen. It would be insane to bet money on that, but that people have bet their eternity right. on those odds. Do not take me to Vegas with those odds, I won't go. Now, if you take me to Vegas with Ozzy, brother Josh, I've got a 99.9999 percent chance that we're gonna win every time. We might talk about my retirement plan at that point. <laughs> but if you take me with the odds of evolution happening to Vegas and say that's that's the odds of us winning money, I'm gonna stay home because it's not happening. So the odds of, of there being no God is basically zero. 
And some people realize that and say, okay, well, maybe there is a God, but he has no, he has no effect on us at all. Agnosticism is the view that the existence of God, of the divine, or the supernatural is unknown or unknowable. Another definition provided is the view that human reason is incapable of providing sufficient rational grounds to justify either the belief that God exists or the belief that God does not exist. So in summary, if God is real, we certainly can't know whether or not he is. We're not smart enough. Okay? The Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God. So respectfully, agnostics, just because you're not smart enough to know doesn't mean nobody is. If you read the Word, it tells you everything you need to know. So well, why is this? Why would God give us a book that seems that seems illogical? All right, scientists like logic. Scientists, I like logic. Let's let's play with logic, folks. So let's think for a moment. Logically, if there is a God, then He must have at some point created communication. We communicate through a number of different ways. I speak to you. In a very strange way, uh, if you think about it, I am creating sounds using the vocal cords in my throat by blowing air over them, and they make sounds in the air, and you translate those sounds into thoughts that I am communicating. I can also write words. Words are vehicles for thoughts. So if God exists, then he must have some way of communication, because he must have created communication. Therefore, if he is God, he must be able to communicate. Logically. This is, this is basic scientific principles. If the creator of communication exists, then he is able to communicate. Okay? So if he is able to communicate, would he not choose to communicate? Otherwise, why would we exist if he did not want to communicate? How would an omnipotent God communicate with the human race if he so existed? Would he perhaps speak using a voice? Genesis, what do we see? So the voice walked with Adam in the garden in the cool of the day. Does it not? Mom's looking at me funny. Oh, well, okay. So where art thou? Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the voice walked with Adam in the cool of the day. Yeah, okay, all right. I'm getting some funny looks, so let's Sorry, make sure that I'm... I can be wrong. I can be wrong. you got to check me. Okay. All right. It's in there. So... <clears throat> Okay, it's in Genesis 3, 8. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Okay, so I've never seen a voice walk, but it says here, there's a voice walking. So, God has a voice. And he tells Adam, and Adam tells other people. And then later he tells people to write things down. So, there is a record from God. There is communication from God. It would exist. Okay, well, if you think about that, there has to be some communication. Well, who is God? Well, if you take the information that God laid out for you, it points you back to Jesus Christ. Turn to John chapter 3. We talked about everybody has heard the name of Jesus Christ. Why doesn't everybody believe the gospel? Jesus Christ is not a secret. Some people think he's a swear word. But he's not a secret. John chapter 3. John chapter 3 verse 12. 
If I have told you earthly things and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? In other words, it's, gonna, it's going right over your head. You're, you're hearing the truth and it's going right over your head. But I don't recognize it. Get in my Bible there in Isaiah 68 where it says the cool of the day. It says the wind of the day. It's a cool wind. In other words, I guess the breeze, a cool. I don't know. But anyway, that's a, that's an awesome thought too. That the very wind and breeze that was moving had God's voice in it. That's beautiful. Do you think Adam questioned whether or not God existed? No. No. That that seems silly to us, right? Why? Because we believe that, that Adam was real. Adam not real. It's all a fairy tale. It's a really, really well put together one. If you think about it. Let's continue on our, our current train of thought. In verse thirteen, no man and no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Checkmate, agnostics. Our God is not a God that doesn't care. Our Creator is not a, a, an absentee Father that, that made us and, and left us. What an insult to God the Father who gave his Son because he cared so much. Verse 17. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Amen. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Well, often you find that people that don't want to believe that there's a God, they, they find that they're somehow smarter than people that cling to their religion. Folks, that's the only way to be. That's the only way to live is to cling to Jesus. People want to look at that as, as weak or, or backwards or, or uneducated. But they're the ones that are so short-sighted. I like to I like to listen to podcasts and, and audiobooks because I have a long drive. And one of the audiobooks that I listened to was The Language of God by Dr. Francis Collins. And I don't agree with everything he says. He's got a lot of information in there. But if you don't know who Dr. Francis Collins is, he is credited with mapping the human genome. Pretty smart guy. He did what no one in history has done before him. When he started, when he left college, he was an atheist. His his story is very is very interesting. When he left college, he was an atheist, and he continued to study the human body. And the more he studied, the more it became impossible for him to think that this was an accident. Like, there's no way that this happened. You know, he's like, you know what? I'm an atheist. I don't believe God exists. I need to prove that God doesn't exist for me to continue on my career. For me to, to like have peace of mind, I just got to prove. I'll figure it out. I'll get proof. I'll have an argument. I'll move on with my life. He said that process left me an absolute wreck and my atheism in burning ruins. I could not. I could not prove that there was not a God, he says. And that led me to the conclusion, there must be one. Then that led me to terror. Oh, who am I before a God that made all this? He has a testimony that leads him to Christianity. Like I said, I don't agree with everything he says. But here's a man 
who knows more about what we're made out of than just about anybody you'll ever come across. And when it came down to it, when he had to make a decision on whether or not God was real, he said, there's no doubt. So you talk about smart people. Smart people don't believe in God. Really smart people can't, can't find a way to not believe in God. Another smart guy I like is Dr. Jordan Peterson. He's a psychologist. I don't know if you've heard of him. Yeah. I like to listen to him because I, I start cleaning my office as soon as I hear him talk because he makes me feel guilty about not being motivated. But it's, it's interesting to watch his journey. He's a very smart guy, one of the smartest people you'll come across. And when I first started listening to him years ago, his, his old lectures, he wasn't sure. He, he would admit he wasn't sure whether or not there was a God. He said the scripture is, in, is an incredible book. He said there's so much truth in it. He goes, I don't believe that it's God inspired. I believe it's just a collection of all the universal truths about man. Everything in it talks to you about it. That is, that is who man is. It's how we are built. It's how we think. It's absolutely true. He said, but I don't, I don't believe for sure that there's a God. I, I'm not sure. I'm not smart enough to know. And then he nearly died. If you look at his history, he had some really weird medical problems, and he spent a year on a deathbed. And if you ask him now, do you believe there's a God? He goes, oh, without doubt. Without doubt, there's no way that there's not one. Because I don't know enough about it to, to, to tell you, you know, anything for sure other than he is real and he's working on me. Folks, people want to claim that they're, that, that intelligent, smart people don't need this. Folks, the smartest, most intelligent people realize that's all there is. <clears throat> and that's the only thing to understand is that God loves us. He sent his son to die for us. And that all other beliefs, and they don't count, they go in a pile of garbage. One of the, the most, one of the most powerful things that Jordan Peterson says about the Bible is, this is, there's no way that he could possibly explain how it has survived to where it is. He's like, the time that it was written, we don't have any other text from. The, the collection of texts, there's nothing like it on earth. The civilizations it writes about don't exist anymore. Why is this still here? Well, it says in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8, The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Right? Amen. Turn to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. There are people that say that, well, you just, you've just got to have faith. That that's how we find God, is we, we've got to have faith and believe. Well, folks, our faith isn't a blind faith where we just we suspend all logic and reason and we say, well, I, I'm just going to choose to believe this. Our faith is a fact and evidence-based faith. We have proof. We have proof here. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and upon and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Seeing then that we have a great high priest, that is passed to the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted, like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find <clears throat> grace and help in time of need. Bible is our proof, our basis of faith. 
the word of God says we are created. He is the creator. Matthew 24, 35 says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. See, one of the things that Jordan Peterson says, and I, I, I like very much, says that truth creates order and lies create chaos. This is true in our spiritual lives. The truth helps us line up our thinking and see things the way that God sees them and the way that they really are. So we, we look at things and we may see it one way, but folks, have you ever look, see, know you've seen something and then come to find out it's not that? Eyes tricked you? It's funny, your brain will actually fill in information that's not there based on what you think. Do you know that your nose is here? If your brain edits it, edits it out, it goes, well, I can not see your nose. Why don't you see your nose all the time? Your brain edits it out. Because it knows, it knows it's there, it doesn't need to see it. Your eyes will lie to you. I know what I saw, I know what I believe. Dump what you think you believe. Start working with this. God's word is so true and so powerful. The word of God is what gives us what our basis of faith is. Shoot, when, when God spoke, the worlds were created. That's the power of the word of God. Amen. Regardless of what any man believes, regardless of what all the other religions say, regardless of all of the different lies and religion and confusion and chaos we find out in the world, the very basis of all that there is for us as humans starts here, where God says, I created you. God so loved the world <clears throat> that he gave his only begotten son. I created a way for you to go to heaven. Whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. So folks, our theology it's not based on storybooks <coughs> or even man's account of history or smart people deciding, you know, what they know is correct or not correct. But we can only base it here. And if you want evidence that this is true, there's evidence out there. But all you have to do is believe the word of God. And that starts a process in your brain, in your mind, in your heart. This is true. God's word is true. Believing in God is what gives us faith. Not We can't just decide that we have faith. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. All right, that's enough for today. Let's close. Dear Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for this church and the people here, Lord. We ask you to bless this message. And those that have heard it, Lord, help us to come back next week. Jesus' name, amen. Hey, brother, on this uh, this verse in Hebrews 4.12, uh, whenever I'm uh, in conversation with someone concerning the gospel and they, they, they come at me with, well, how do I know that um, my spirit is saved, but I still sin in the flesh? Um, I go right to this verse here, um, the, the operation of God during salvation. It says, it's a sharp with any two-edged sword, piercing you and dividing of the soul and spirit cutting it away from the from the joints and the marrow of the flesh and they compare it to most of these are young people and it's like a basketball where when that basketball is aired up and the the breath of life revives that spirit uh that that air will never touch the dirt that that basketball ever touches even though that skin on the outside until that spirit is called out by god uh, and goes to to heaven so and that example seems that it, it gives them an understanding of how somebody um, that the word of God is, is that sharp that it can divide those things and isolate the spirit that God has said it's saved once for all. So it's just something I use. Amen. All right. Thank you, Brother Mark. It's relatable.